is going to be an amazing one. Our guest today is an exceptional woman. She graduated from Georgetown University in politics and security studies and then went to do her law degree at Cambridge University. I would like to introduce to you Morial Shah. Thank you so much Morial for being on the show with us today. Thank you for having me Fatima. It's a huge honor to be here to be in Tanzania and to be with you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so let's get started. Um, uh, in our talks, you mentioned that you know your parents wanted you to do medicine. Uh, what made you go to Georgetown and study politics instead? Um, you know, I heard there was a girl called Fatima there. I thought I'd go <laughs> and join her. <laughs> no, um, I'd always been interested in the social and polit polit political aspect of things, and um, my mother wanted me to do medicine. I was pre-med at school. Um, but I thought I'd expand my horizons a little bit, try out something different. I applied to a lot of colleges in the U.S., and I guess it was Georgetown because I got accepted. Okay. So, yeah, went there and experimented a little bit initially, but then my interest lay in politics and security studies. Those were most relevant to my region, so I pursued those. In what way was it relevant to your region? Um, well, Partly relevant because I, I took those subjects partly because they were relevant to my region, partly because those were what I had always been interested in. So I'd always been sort of politically active from a very young age because of my family background and because of how my parents raised me. Security studies was relevant to our part of the world, of course, considering that it's Pakistan and um, most of the South Asia classes at Georgetown were flagged with security studies. So um, that ended up being my major concentration invariably and also because I took a I took a wide variety of classes actually I did a lot of anthropology women and gender studies but they all ended up coming into the umbrella of peace and security studies just generally so that's what I ended up so, doing. So um, Georgetown is known for its school of foreign service of course right and you have so many presidents um, of, of countries around the world so many ministers um, that have graduated from there you know, uh, as, as a woman in, from Pakistan, um, you know, the norm would be to do something that's not so, um, what's the word? It's, it, you know, not so um, out there, you know, uh, something that's in the norm. So medicine would be something that's, you know, very, very normal yeah. because you can pursue uh, being a pharmacist with politics. Yeah, I'm, politics I'm glad you raised this. I, I remember discussing this with one of my uncles who was aware that I was in the U.S. but wasn't aware of what I was studying and I said, I'm doing politics, and he was taken aback, shocked. He said, not medicine? Who studies politics? You want to be president of Pakistan? Just, you know, just look after the farm a little bit, and you'll, you'll be there. Okay. Um, so it really wasn't a concept. And even when I told people that I was at the School of Foreign Service, they said, well, are you going to join the Foreign Service afterwards? Or you're studying politics, so you're yeah. obviously going to be a politician afterwards. Uh -huh. um, those were, in, in those, it was challenging to cir circle, circumvent my way around those views. Most people just thought that I'd come back and, you know, I could, if I wanted to do politics, I could have done it without the degree. Um, but I think those views need to perhaps change and people need to accept that everybody will not go out there and do medicine, engineering, or what is traditionally done. Sometimes we have to explore our options, study other subjects, and um, Georgetown gave me that opportunity. As a liberal arts college, I got to study a bit of everything, and as you very rightly noted, um, just that exposure to all the heads of state that were visiting, all the ambassadors that were, that were teaching us classes, uh, that helped me change my world vision and that helped me feel powerful in more ways than one because I knew that I had access to all the resources, you know, you name, I mean, Georgetown gave me the opportunity to have lunch with Bill Clinton, Georgetown gave me the opportunity to be sitting in a classroom where Madeleine Albright was teaching, so you know, those kind of opportunities I wouldn't have had anywhere else and I think they definitely changed my percept, change how I look at myself and change also how I look at looked at my society because again you know I'm from a little village in Pakistan yes the village is 2.5 million people but 
yes, I'm also the first girl who went to the United States for undergraduate education and studied something that other people don't usually study. So, you, you know, it's, that's, that's the thing, you know, it's challenging, but it's doable. And I think you're a live example of somebody who, who you know, just went against the norm and did something and accomplished something. Yeah, um, it definitely because, involved a lot of hard work. Right. Um, you know, I didn't, I supported myself throughout. I had a full ride scholarship. I wasn't dependent on anybody. I worked two jobs, made my ends meet. And um, there's, some, there's a happy feeling yeah. about that at the end of the day, yeah. that you've done something that other people can, it just, I, I almost feel like sometimes when I go home back to my village and I speak to the girls there, they, they know that I'm from the community and when they talk to me, it's like they can have dreams bigger than say whatever is limited to them in their village, like they, they can reach for the stars and you know, not come it, yeah, back with a ha handful of dust. Exactly. Others, that's exactly. That's exactly. Although I, I don't think I'm quite there yet, but yes, I've done a couple of things that maybe it's, a lot of other people have not done. Yeah and some people may find it a little inspiring. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about what you do now. Um, you teach European law um, and uh, company law at a university in Pakistan, yeah. right? So why did you choose to do this? Well, I had a law degree, had to make some use of it. Okay. Um, no, um, that's a good question actually. When I got into the law, it was through human rights research that I had been doing at Georgetown. I have worked in Pakistani jails in my village um, they're in a terrible state. Last time I went, I met a prisoner who had been in there for, you know, eight years and had never seen the inside of a courtroom. He thought he was there because he sold his neighbor's goat. He was actually there for some murder charge. He didn't even know. Right. And I had to like speak to the police officials, get him legal help. I'd also worked on uh, women who were uh, sort of they were forcibly evicted from their home after the male family head died. Right. So this was a mother and her three daughters. They came to me in a state where they were beaten up. Mm -hmm. They had some teeth missing. It was, um, and I was able to sort that out by making a few, I mean, at that point, like it was, I thought, I, I was confused as to what to do to help them. And I was able to make a few phone calls to the local police station without using any names or anything, just being like, police officer, these women in your area have been brutally evicted from right. their home, can you help them get back right. in? And I was able to do that and I felt like there was such a lack of knowledge about what the laws are. So that prisoner in the jail did not know that he had to be presented in a courtroom, right. did not know that he should have had access to a lawyer, did not know that he cannot just be picked up off the street and yeah. be kept in jail for eight years for picking up his goat, for stealing his neighbor's goat, which he said he did not do. Um, so, uh, things like that made me very conscious of the practical value that the law has. And then at Georgetown, I was doing legal research with a professor um, on women's rights and laws in Pakistan and how, you know, I mean, there's laws, but they're not really implemented and therefore we have the state of women's rights that we do. I was doing that research. I wrote my, I sent my paper to Cambridge. It got accepted. It took me for a special program. Um, and then I thought I'd get a little practical. I was doing company law and I quite liked that. Um, and because one has to train as a lawyer in the UK, I do have a training contract with a firm there and I might be going back there again. But for the time being, I'm in Pakistan and I thought that the best way to give back to my country and to make people knowledgeable about the law at this stage is through teaching. Right. And so that's what I'm doing. And it's a great opportunity to mentor students, to take them to events, to um, sort of shape their views about the law and the world. I mean, I'm not saying I'm shaping them in a particular way or the other, but it's just interesting to be that I always was blessed with great teachers, teachers who made me think out of the box, teachers who made me believe in myself, teachers who valued my opinion, and I would try to do that as much as possible with my students. Yeah, so, yeah the right yeah. teachers you remember for the rest of your life. Exactly, right? like my teachers, I am where I am because I had fabulous teachers, otherwise I would have just been in Pakistan, just your average girl. It was because, you know, my seventh grade geography teacher read out my answer to the whole class and everybody clapped that I thought, okay, maybe I'm not that stupid, you know, maybe if I work hard, I'm not going to get a D in everything and I might be able to work my way to university. That's very, very inspiring. Um, uh, so, 
You've done quite a uh, bit of volunteering, right? Um, you mentioned you did it at Joshan, you did some at Cambridge, you did some uh, back in Pakistan. Uh, why did you start and, and what, what made you get involved? So I think part of the story has to do with that teacher who really inspired me. She was my geography teacher and she had this practical hands-on approach to geography. So if she was teaching us about waterlogging and salinity, she made us go and see it. If she was teaching us about a particular kind of tree, she made us go, she made us go and look at those trees like conifers trees up north or, or um, other kinds of grassland that she was teaching us about or different crops that she was teaching us about and I think those things really instilled in me a love for my land and where I come from and I was an exception in my little school. I went to a convent in Karachi with other 45 other girls and I was one of the very few that came from a village and that had a farm and um, I used to live this life where I was going transitioning between that farm and what I consider to be real Pakistan and that little artificial uh, little insular bubble that we live in. We call it Cliftonia, it's Clifton and Defence, two gated communities where the rich people of Pakistan live. Um, because I was doing that all the time, um, she just made me fall in love with that real Pakistan and she made it possible for me to so off, to very frequently go there and look at what was happening there and then the funny story was, so I was very passionate about her subject, the one that she taught, she taught me geography and then it, that became Pakistan studies so um, I really wanted to do well and in my final exam I had so much to write, my final British O-level exam, that I wasn't able to complete the paper. I wrote like five sentences for the last question and I had to stop mid-sentence. And it was a question about my favorite politician and his social policies. So it was devastating for me to have left that there in mid-sentence. And after that, I was very upset. And I spoke to my parents and I said, look, I don't think my knowledge of Pakistan or my passion for my people needs to be determined based on an exam that I take. I want to pack up my bags and go out and to the villages. Um, and my mother had a friend who was running schools all across Sin. So she put me in contact with her. I went there and I discussed my sort of skill set with her and she said that she would like for me to go around to all the schools. Uh, considering that I had been to a good school in Karachi, I could go in, uh, talk to the students because I speak Sindhi. They would be able to relate to me, just write about their stories, write about the teachers, write, prepare materials for them that they could send to their donors in the US. And this was for a few uh, programs run by Save the Children and by World Bank. So um, I started with that. 15 year old then, 15 year old then, I packed up my bags, I went up across Sin, and. I guess I just fell in love with the province and the people. I met real people with real issues, real concerns, real dreams. People who wanted to do something. When I went to school, Fatima, like a lot of girls, I was I loved them, really. Yeah. But a lot of people I were with didn't want to do anything with their lives. Right. Beyond, say, you know, the next party or the next fashion show. I'm not saying that those things are shallow, but I'm just saying I fell in love with the fact that I met girls who told me that their dream was to, to eat dal for dinner. Because there are parts of Sindh where you don't even get lentils, you get like chilies, they would just eat dried chilies for dinner, that's right. all they used to eat because it was a desert area. Yeah. Or like girls who told me they wanted to be a doctor when they grew up but they had never seen a doctor, they'd only seen lady health workers that used to come to their village or they'd tell me things like we want to be doctors because you know, my sister died in childbirth yeah. one of the girls I still remember, Sakina, she told me that or like Zina told me about all the difficulties that she had to brave all the pressure that she had from the community to not be a teacher and she became a teacher, she was attacked, she was you know, verbally abused. All those kind of things really changed who I was at the core and then for 10 years I've been on and off involved with the Industry Resource Centre and I keep going to their schools and being involved with their uh, community engagement um, processes and it was encouraged and interesting because I not only met the students who were my age and spoke to them about what they dreamed of, I spoke to the teachers and their problems and they also had, every school had a little community organization which would have all the community elders coming in and they were very sort of open about what they had to say. They used to say things like, oh you know we are Sayyid so we don't, Sayyid are descendants of the Prophet so we don't send our daughters to school or you know I started sending my daughters to school and the milkman in the, in the uh, village bazaar said, uh, sign do you want me to burn my eyes out? because your daughter is going to school and she's not wearing a burqa and the I daughter just, is I just eight years old. I just stop you there and I, I think that that is so, so ironic yeah. because I know Pakistan is predominantly Muslim mm -hmm. and although that they have these views towards yeah. um, these very weird, it's, it's, yeah. most, it's culture, yeah. these views towards how <laughs> women should not be educated and it's yeah. such a bad thing if they are 
it's so ironic because in Islam, you see the the, the biggest ladies, um, uh, Zainab or Bibi Khatija, they were all such smart women. They were business women, and uh, they came at a time of of, of ignorance where where you know children were being buried alive, and uh, you know it. The, the Prophet used to say, what are you doing? This is not the religion. So do you think that the, the, this, there's a lot of culture and religion, mix of culture and religion in, in Pakistan? So Fatma, I'd say that this is, it has nothing to do with religion. And I would say it has nothing to do with culture or rivage either. Because, you know, as a student of anthropology, I don't tend to pin things down on culture and say, oh, this is the fault of culture, or this is a cultural right. practice. Right. Because culture is changing, it's not static. Customs are changing, they are what you make them, right. or what the right. community makes them. And right. you have to go down to the functional roots of why you wouldn't want a woman educated, or you wouldn't want a girl uh, sort of being powerful and expressing her views. And in fact, through these discussions with the community, it came out. So I, I used to be like, why don't you send your daughters to school? And they'd say things like, but if we send them to school, they learn how to write chits, they learn how to write letters. And when they write those letters, in Sindhi, the context or the, the meaning behind that is they'll be writing it to people that they want to marry, so to boys. Mm -hmm. And then they'll elope with those boys. And then what happens is there's a land issue because the girl inherits 25% of the land, the boy side of the family will demand land or cash in kind. And land is the source of politics, is the source of power yeah. in Northern Sindh. In, even in some sense, much of Pakistan, and I'm assuming in most agricultural communities, even here in Tanzania, if that land goes out of the family, that is a problem for the clan. And um, for that reason, they want to limit women's agency, limit their ability to inherit land, to control land, to uh, have um, control over family assets that are a source of power and honor. Um, so it came out clearly there and then. It was about the fact that she would then gain some sense of agency, which is what they feared. It didn't have anything to do with religion. They did not say, this is our culture, this is, you know, that it has always been this way in our yeah. village. Although that came up too, but that was intrinsically tied to this fact that they were afraid of girls getting agency, right. of girls questioning, of girls demanding their rights, rights that were given to them as a matter of law right. and as a matter of also religion. Right. So, okay. yes. No, I, I mean, I can, I can I know because I read I read the news and I see all this and I don't understand it because I think that they try to show the world or rather the world misconceives it um, as you know it's a religious issue where in fact we are sitting here and we're saying wow that's so ironic yeah, because in fact religion is used against these things and you know yeah. this whole problem of women not having agency in northern sin this ties up to the to what I call the ghairat economy to the honor economy okay. um, right what that means is women uh, men possess honor and because men also possess women, women are commodities, women, are, um, women aren't capable of possessing honor, they only possess shame, quote unquote. Um, and everything is about, and the aim of social relations is to make sure that women do nothing to defile the man's honor. They're commodities, they're like buffalo cows, gold that you own or land that you own. Um, they're productive, they have some value because they add value to your income and because they pick cotton and they milk the cows and everything. Yeah. But you don't want them to come to a point where they're going to say, well, oh, I milk the cow, now I'm going to keep the milk or I'm going to drink it first or I'm going to give it to my children or I'm going to choose who I marry. Yeah. And with that, when they, particularly when they decide to, the, the biggest form I think of, of uh, defiance towards this cultural code cultural code, quote unquote, or this value-based code, uh, economic value-based code, it, the biggest form of defiance to that is when they choose to marry off of their own free will. And that then gives rise to what we call Karo Kari and Sin, what is called Tora Tori in Balochistan, what's called, um, uh, you know, uh, Siya Kari in Balochistan, Tora Tori in Pakhtun Kwa, sorry, Kala Kali in Punjab. It's um, basically honor killing. And the woman, Karo, black, is, I don't know why they use black, most, some people say it has to do with black magic. Basically, black is just considered what is wrong. Yeah. So these girls are labeled black women and the men are labeled black men. Men can pay their way out of the honor grievance that they've committed. Women get killed and uh, buried without a gravestone or anything of the sort. Um, and it's, it's, uh, my region has the highest incidence of that, about 45% of the national, Pakistan has the highest number of honor killings in the world. Um, 
So I guess that, that, that they're just afraid. And killings, women. exactly, and killings are just the most extreme form. So there's a whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. On the mega scale, the practices that we see are karokari, we see vana, which is when you trade girls to settle blood feuds. So for instance, my brother kills your brother and then we have a number of killings going on in exchange over, over a couple of years. That is resolved by exchanging girls. So you kill, for instance, my brother kills your brother and then you want to kill my other brother. Yeah. To resolve that dispute, we'll say, okay, no, take my younger sisters. And right. if the girl is above the age of seven, they give one. If it's younger than seven, they'll give two. And there's literally been cases when mothers punch their daughters' faces to take their teeth out to, to show that the girl is teething. So she's above the age of seven, so you only take one, you don't take two. There's, there's things like that that are happening and all of that is intrinsically connected to the fact that women aren't viewed as independent, uh, valuable, you know, at the same time, I have to be careful, I have to check myself because at the same time there is this whole narrative of women being uh, equivalent to seven Quran, we say Nyani Bar is seven Quran, women signify are because they are a means for defiling a man's honour, they also possess some of it, like they also... Uh, you don't want women being insulted in the public and right. that kind of thing. So there is that element of sort of we're going to respect our family's women, but they're not respected as individuals with human agency. That is lacking um, because of, again, of the fact that they're not allowed to have their own land and mobility and those kind of things become problematic for them in, in social relations. And so we have this whole system of honor feeding in. And I've studied it for... You know, since I was at Georgetown, and that's what got me to Cambridge, and that's what takes me back again and again, because I encounter these issues every day. Whether it's a woman being physically abused, whether it's a woman being mentally abused, whatever it is, it has it ties back into this idea that uh, women aren't respected. Sometimes, partly because they don't respect themselves, almost um, as as independent agents. Um, and was it difficult for you to, you know, Pakistan is a there, there are a couple of war zones, yeah. you know. Yeah. So was it difficult for you to move around? You well, know? you know, as long as you don't tell your parents too much, everything is kosh. I just tell my parents, because my village is in Northern Sin, I just tell them, yeah, I'm going to the village. And they'd be like, okay, she's in the village, maybe she'll go to like a school or something that's close by. I didn't tell them details. But yes, there have been times where I've been caught. Uh, again, what got me to studying honor killing was this one time that, again, when I was first started working with the Indus Resource Center back in 2006, I was in a village, uh, the Methlo Goat, close to Khairpur, it's about 25 kilometers away, and uh, I was having a, a, a sort of negotiation with the elder of that village, uh, Mr. Allavar, I always still remember his name, and I was trying to convince him to sell his buffalo, and in return for that, because World Bank wanted the community to give something to show its seriousness, and then it would um, expand the school from second grade to a school that would go up to 10th grade, and children would be able to take matriculation exams that Pakistan government ordains. So I was having these negotiations with him, and there were, there were gunshots all around, and I could hear them, and uh, you know we had to evacuate and move out and everything. And later that evening, I found out, when my aunt found out that I'd been there, she was livid, because uh, 14, 13 or 14 people died that day. Um, this was a clan feud that was occurring between the Methlos and the Kalhoras because uh, a girl from one side married a boy from the other side and uh, then there was the land issue. Kalhoras were demanding land from the Methlos and uh, Methlos had didn't want to give that land and they said that you've kidnapped our girl, give her back. So obviously there was this feud. It lasted about 10 years and um, that got me studying and you know when and the funny part was when the police came in, they actually rounded up everybody's chickens and buffaloes and took them in so that both sides on both in both villages so that both sides would stop fighting and come to the police station to recover their property, <laughs> and that's how they resolved it. Right. But um, yeah, the ab complete absence of law and order. Pakistan, it, things get interesting when you start traveling. You right. you go there and you see real people and real problems, and right. yeah, the but, next um, pair of shoes of the next party becomes a little less. A little less rag of it, right. a little less um, But I think that it's so interesting that, that despite all this, um, because of your passion, mm -hmm. you went out and you um, wanted to really study mm -hmm. people in their, in, their, in their habitat, in their homes, and uh, 
really connect with them, you know, despite the bombs that are going off or the the gunshots that are going off, you know. So one of my favorite areas to work in is Shikarpur's Lucky Talka. It's it's probably since one of Sin's most dangerous places to be. Most mostly I just don't tell my grandfather I've gone there. I don't even tell my aunt that I've gone there. My parents are little they know the better. Almost every time I've gone there, I've heard gunshots, and I was there just a month, two months ago, and uh, I saw incredible. But you, the thing is, when you see incredible things happening in these areas, you go back to be a part of that change, to do what little you can. Now I can't, I don't have the money to build a hospital or to build a school or to run right. any of these things. But my job is reporting on it, and my job is giving, um, making reports, consulting advice, uh, sending things to donors that can then help those organizations run. So like. I first uh, was in the Lucky Talka in 2011 when I was working with UNICEF and it was like a, I saw um, gunshots started all around so we had to find shelter somewhere and we went to this little red brick building. It was kind of broken down, two of the rooms were not functional but there was a doctor there which was really surprising in this area and it was very needed because of all the conflict that was going on and uh, mainly at that time he was attending to women and I saw a bunch of lady health workers who also gathered there because it was the first of the month and they were discussing their strategy and that was really inspiring in the middle of all this conflict and chaos in a zone Lucky Talka is on a shifting unmapped zone it's right. part of Sin's Kacha it's part of the Indus River's riverbed boundaries and, and, and uh, like homes and lands they are always shifting um, to find these people there working, reporting, it was incredible. And then just two months ago, um, I was uh, volunteering with an organization called People's Primary Health Care Initiative. It's an NHS like, um, the way NHS sometimes contracts out healthcare to firms, the same government has contracted out healthcare to this firm. And I was seeing how it's performing with regard to SIN's basic health care. And I went back to the same basic health care unit. When I had gone in 2011, it was the PPHI that was running it. But at that time, it had been really broken down. Now it was a full facility, five or six rooms in one building, five or six in the other, over 300 patients. Uh, an ambulance, x-ray machines, ultrasounds, um, blood testing laboratory, all of that functioning and around it the same degree of chaos. But this thing went from just being a tiny, almost broken down right. red brick building to being bigger and to now expanding. Um, those kind of things really inspire me to continue going back again and continue fighting for it no matter how difficult it is. And security is just the very small part of, you know, I can get around it by not telling people where I am. Um, the bigger stuff, of course, comes into people's expectations. And but I think like that this is, this is what women need to know. They need to see, they need to be aware, and uh, they need to be in the field in order to make a change. And I think that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of women need to learn that to, to sort of, you know, um, get out of a bubble. And, and, and this bubble is it may be created by external yeah, factors exactly, or themselves. Exactly. And sometimes Fatima people tend to think, women particularly tend to think that if they go out to these villages or they do these jobs, consulting, etc., that they will face more discrimination or harassment, which is not true in my experience, touch wood. I have faced more discrimination and harassment working in the US, working in the UK, and working in Pakistan's corporate sector right. than I have ever faced in the villages of my country. Right. My people, and I'm sure people in Tanzania, are very respectful. They are pleased to see that you know members of the community are coming back to of where course. their roots yeah. are to yeah. help out, to 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 discuss real issues. Um, I have received nothing but respect from right. the people of Sindh, right. but everywhere else it's been, you know. Challenging. challenging. It's like, yeah. who, who do you think you are? Get this, get that, go get coffee, or like right. just being given meal work, or, 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 you know, not being taken seriously, and yeah. sometimes being made a joke. Uh, you don't find that when you, and I think it also has to do with what you're really passionate about. So maybe I haven't had that kind of passion when I'm working in the corporate sector. Right. I've just had that when I'm out there in the village, oh, and right. with, with people, and, and, yeah. and, you know, doing real things that can make a difference to people. At the end of the day, it's um, what makes you happy and what, when you go home, that you feel good, exactly. that you've done something to give back. Okay. Um, so, do, I want to, this is something I, I really want to talk to you about. Um, do a lot of women in Pakistan hold leadership positions? 
Yes, they do. Fair, a fair number do. So we have had uh, an incredible female prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, who was prime minister twice. She's inspiring for a lot of women across Sindh. And usually, whenever I have these buffalo goat negotiations, I tend to always, almost always, there's a picture of her somewhere nearby. And I point to it and I say, you know, you all have Benazir's pictures on your walls. You all vote for her party. Why aren't you sending your daughters to school? Don't you want them to be like Benazir? Benazir went to Oxford. And that usually gets silence and usually I get the community to be sending, you know, 200 of whatever girls. This particularly, I remember Mithil, um, the Qureshi goat in Khairpur, Mohammed Hussain Qureshi goat, where I was able to get um, a school that had capacity for 200 girls was getting around 19 women. And then I had this communication, this sort of negotiation with the community mm -hmm. where I pointed to a picture of Benazir that they had mm -hmm. in a fridge nearby and then the school started working. So, so there's Benazir Bhutto. Then we've had a speaker of the National Assembly who was a woman, and we've had, uh, we have about 33% women in parliament. They're very vocal. They do 80% of the legislative work. They're on TV most of the time. They're on popular media. So women are very much present in these areas. Uh, does that really mean that they are in, uh, empowered? Now we have to be careful there because we see women in parliament, we see women as CEOs, we see women in, uh, you know, in, in leading positions in the fashion industry for instance, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't face discrimination, that they don't have to work twice as hard as a man to be taken seriously, that uh, some of them face the worst forms, the stories, the horror stories I've heard of the harassment and discrimination that they've faced at working in the best corporate institutions, working in the best international organizations, working in the best NGOs. I mean, Dr. Fawzia Saeed, for instance, who's written publicly about her experience, uh, um, bad experience, who's actually working at the UN when, when things happened. So it's not that there aren't challenges for them. It's just that there are a lot of Pakistani women that are toughening up and, and rising up to those challenges. Sometimes I understand. For some women, in some positions, it can be next to impossible. Like if it's you know your, your boss that's harassing you, there's no way that you can proceed and continue in that firm or, or that organization or that government department. But uh, now we have laws, we have a hotline um, and things. But yes, generally, it's, it's um, although we see women in these, some of these positions, it's not correlated with, with women being empowered or women not facing problems. Because and, they do, and and they do, do worldwide. This is a global problem. Okay. And why do you think that some women who either choose not to do anything or because of cultural reasons which you don't agree with or because of where they are or their families, they don't really aspire to anything. Are they women like that? Um, before we get to that, Fatima, I also just wanted to get it because we're talking about like cultural reasons. I just remembered from the US where I worked in a law firm, it was probably the only other female intern my age right. there, like everybody else there, all the women, I felt like they were manning up, like they were wearing suits only, they'd cut their hair short, they were afraid of accepting their femininity and I, femininity, and I felt like that was upsetting and I find that globally. Yes, and yeah. and um, I don't have to do that when I'm back in my village. So why do women in Washington DC walking down power corridors have to do that? And I've well, often discussed these yeah. problems with yeah. women in DC and they're like, but you know, you just have to, it's a man's world, just, just man up and you know, like Madeleine Albright, call yourself chairman of NDI and you know, or chairperson, just do it. And I just find like, I find that a little disconcerting sometimes and I wish that that's one thing about the world that changes and hopefully it, it will. It is a global issue because yeah. um, if, you know, there, there was a research done and basically, you know, women uh, don't really have, um, they, they don't really aspire to take leadership positions as much as men do because they have this preconceived idea that, you know, they have to get married yeah. and, and yes, they do, you know, that, that it's, it's not a bad thing and they have to have kids. And the other um, one is women get bullied very easily. For right. instance, I've I tried practicing in Pakistan for a little bit and I found that because our courts are just an old boys club, they next to don't let women in. There's right. next to no girl my age who goes to court on a daily basis. Those are things I did not know when I first joined a law firm in Pakistan uh, as an internee and I was asked whether I wanted to go to court. I was like, I'm a lawyer. What do you think I'm supposed to do? Yeah. You know? And um, 
and then the, my colleague was explaining to me, but you know, women don't go to court. I was like, what are you talking about? Women in my village go to court. Right. They wear their uniform, they go to court every day, half our judges are women. So you're the city and it's, right. it's supposed to be better here. Right. But it's just because of the way things are structured, it was an old boys club and they didn't have women going in. And I spoke to lawyers in New York, in DC, in London, and they've all confirmed the same thing. Yeah. Most litigators tend to be men. Most people at top positions in corporate law firms globally yeah. tend to be men. Yeah. And as, as lawyers, I, I, as a lawyer, I find that a little disconcerting because we talk about human rights, we talk about equality, we talk about empowerment, we, we have to stand up for justice and we are to uphold, uh, make sure that the law is upheld. We know it better than most people and yet we, 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 we fall prey to these social problems, these social sort of um, dynamics, which is yeah. something that's a little troubling at, yeah. at the day's end. Okay, um, so you already mentioned your role model. Um, you said Benazir Bhutto has really inspired you, you know, since you were young. Uh, can you um, tell us a little yeah, bit so about that? Yeah, so Benazir was inspiring to me always, but, um, and I was like six years old. I went to the same school that Benazir did, and I read um, uh, an art, a little a new magazine, article in our magazine, school magazine, by another girl from my class who wanted to grow up and be prime minister. And um, I wrote one myself about that. And I just used to find her extremely inspiring. And I wanted to be prime minister like her. Um, but then there's also been other women, Fatma, that are inspiring. I don't limit my role model to just one woman. Like, my mother is an incredible woman. Right. She works six jobs. She is Pakistan's top gynecologist. She has done everything possible to make opportunity right. to, to make sure that I have ha I have had the opportunities that I have had you know right. um, and uh, my aunts are all incredible I and yeah. they're all top of their profession right. one of them is a PhD anthropologist one of them is a World Bank economist one of the other ones also a gynecologist yeah. the others are all doctors um, and I have a third, 12, 12, 13 how many aunts do I, have? I think I have 13 aunts yes I have 13 aunts quite quite the, quite the large number and um, they're all incredible leaders in their field. I was surrounded by all of these strong women. They were all inspiring in their different ways. My teachers were inspiring. I would consider Ms. Ms. Matabani my role model. Um, with uh, she was also a lawyer, and then she was teaching us to be leaders. That that I found that inspiring. I find you inspiring. You know, you've you've had quite the way you've sort of. Um, played golf all your life and you've managed your studies and you went to Georgetown and now you're back and you're head of marketing and you've got your own TV show. I find that inspiring. I find inspiration from different things and I have many different role models and each of them has taught me something. Right. And I think that, that, that that's the most beautiful thing about women is that they are able to do so many things at the same time. You know, um, just because you are a mother or just because you are a wife doesn't limit you. Incredible. My yeah. mom gave birth to babies, went to med school, right. became a specialist, was managing her career and making sure right. everything was perfect for us at home. Yeah. And so many mothers do that. Yeah. And, and then I they go through their so health problems the and family. everything. And it's, it's good for being in a relationship because you know when you come back home you you both having intelligent conversations and even for your kids because at the end of the day the day it's the mother that spends a lot of time with the kids and, and you're proud of both your parents and the right. work that they do right. and it also creates a sort of balance within the home yeah. right, in terms of both parents being strong and empowered and you drawing inspiration and strength from both of them and and, and knowing that both of them have your back, and that really helps. Yeah, it does. Um, on that note, thank you so much for being with us on the show. Um, I think that I learned so much about Pakistan over the past few days. Um, I learned so much about um, how, how in certain ways it's very similar, you know, to, to Tanzania, to our culture. Um, and you know how, how in other ways it's very different, you know, so thank you for coming. Do I have time for a comment on yes, Pakistan and Tanzania? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted, I really wanted to add, since I've come here, I've been observing women here. Okay. So first day when I was going around, I saw that there were women sweeping the streets, I saw that there were women policing the streets, I saw right. that there were women walking on the streets. Yeah. I haven't seen that kind of public presence of women in Pakistan. I know that there are women police officers. I don't see them on the streets. Mm -hmm. I know that there are, I mean, I, I don't think there's any women on the sweeping staff, but there need to be. 
I don't see women walking on the sidewalk. I need to see them. And I've seen those things here. I've been incredibly inspired and I hope that both our countries can learn a little bit from each other and take things forward because Tanzania seems to be doing incredibly well on the peace front, on um, its economic growth front. Pakistan, not so much. And, uh, but there are other things that we have, we have strengths in and I think that both countries can learn from each other and, and take things forward. You know, developing countries uniting would be a good thing for development all over the world. Definitely, definitely. Okay, thank, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, it was okay. such a pleasure. Okay.